Hello everyone, in this video we will talk about the final stage of aerobic respiration, the oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation takes place in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Remember that a mitochondrion has double membrane, inner and outer membrane, and the inner membrane makes foldings called as crystae. The reason that the inner membrane, the crystae, makes foldings is to increase the surface area. But for what? The energy for the phosphorylation of ADP to ATP comes from the activity of the electron transport chain, or ETC, which is in fact a group of proteins embedded on the membrane, on the inner membrane. So the larger the surface area, the more the ETC complex is embedded on the membrane. Okay, since our journey started with one single glucose molecule at the very beginning, the only place where ATP molecules are formed was during the glycolysis and during the Krebs cycle. And those ATP molecules are produced by substrate level phosphorylation. So far till ETC, the number of ATP molecules produced are two from glycolysis and two at the Krebs cycle. So four ATP molecules totally is quite low. So where is all this energy from glucose? In all the stages of aerobic respiration, including glycolysis, the link reaction, and in the Krebs cycle, hydrogen atoms are split and are carried by electron carriers. The most important contribution of the Krebs cycle to the cell's energetics is the release of hydrogens which can be used in oxidative phosphorylation to provide energy to make ATP. Reduced NADs that are produced in glycolysis, in link reaction and in Krebs cycle, and reduced FADs produced in the Krebs cycle are passed to the electron transport chain. For A2 biology, you don't need to know any names of the any protein complexes in ETC. Here, as the reduced NAD reaches the ETC, hydrogens are removed, and each hydrogen is split into its proton, the hydrogen ion, and the electron. The energetic electron is transferred to the first of a series of electron carrier, as you can see here in the diagram. So as this protein complex receives the electron, it's energized, and this energy is used to pump the hydrogen ion or the proton from the matrix of the mitochondrion to the intermembrane space. So it happens the same here. The reduced FAD gives the hydrogen at a, at a different point. Electron is picked up so this protein is energized by receiving the electron and this energy is used to pump the proton from matrix into the intermembrane space. So the proton ion concentration increases in the intermembrane space. So we say an electrochemical gradient is formed. Okay, how is this gradient formed? Why not the protons simply flow back? Because the permeability of the inner membrane to hydrogen ion is different than the outer membrane. It's basically impermeable to protons, to so hydrogen ions. So the hydrogen ions can only be pumped into the intermembrane space by using energy, which is provided by the electrons transferred okay, in ETC. And the protons stay there, increasing in concentration and forming a gradient because this membrane here is impermeable to protons. Here is a mitochondrion, outer membrane, and inner membrane crystal making foldings to increase the surface area. Double membrane in fact means two lipid bilayers. This is a single membrane with phospholipid bilayer. So how would the double layer of a mitochondrion would look like? So where is the ETC? The proteins of electron transport chain are located on the crystal, like this. So there is in fact a space between the two membrane of the mitochondria, called as the intermembrane space. The last component of ETC is a very special protein, called as the ATP synthase. As you can guess from the name, ATP synthase is an enzyme. Due to the electrochemical gradient of protons on the inner membrane space of the mitochondrion, the hydrogen ions or the protons start moving down the gradient, but through the ATP synthase. ATP synthase is a very special protein complex which is actually made up of uh, several units. So as the protons flow through it, the ATP synthase rotates and the kinetic energy 
is released and this energy is used to form ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. This type of energy production is called as oxidative phosphorylation because this includes the oxidation and reduction of the protein complexes in the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. And the flow of these protons down the electrochemical gradient from high concentration from the intermembrane space into the matrix, that flow is called as chemiosmosis. The reason we call this aerobic respiration is oxygen is involved. But so far we didn't see any oxygen molecule involved in anywhere from, from glycolysis to oxidative phosphorylation. Finally, oxygen has a role to play as the final electron acceptor. In the mitochondrial matrix, an electron and a proton are transferred to oxygen, reducing it to water. The electron, brought by either by reduced NAD or by reduced FAD, travels through the ETC and eventually leaves the ETC so that further electrons can come and run through. So the ETC complex can, can keep running. And eventually, the electron and the proton are accepted by the oxygen and this forms the water molecule. So oxygen is the final electron acceptor. Without oxygen molecule present in the mitochondrial matrix, accepting the electron from the ETC, the electron transport chain will eventually stop running. So the whole cellular respiration will stop running. Okay, let's calculate the overall ATP production in aerobic respiration stage by stage. The first stage of aerobic respiration, glycolysis. In glycolysis, remember, four ATP molecules are produced but since two ATP molecules are used, the net gain are two ATP molecules, of course, at substrate level phosphorylation. And the second stage of aerobic respiration is the link reaction, in which the pyrite, the pyrite is oxidized into acetyl-CoA, and there is no ATP production here. And the third stage is the citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle. Number two ATP molecules are produced in citric acid cycle per glucose molecule by subset level phosphorylation, of course. But that's all. The great majority of the ATP is actually produced by oxidative phosphorylation. So we need to take into account the number of reduced NAD and reduced FAD produced in the stages of cellular respiration. Now let's check them out. In glycolysis per a glucose molecule, totally two reduced NAD are formed, okay? And in link reaction, again, for one link reaction, one reduced NAD, but for one glucose molecule, we're talking about two pyruvates, so two link reactions. So totally, we consider for one glucose molecule every single step. So in link reaction, totally two reduced NAD molecules are formed, okay? And remember in the Krebs cycle, per one cycle, three reduce NAD. So totally, considering one glucose molecule again, totally six reduced NAD and two reduced FAD molecules are formed. And it's, it's only the Krebs cycle where the reduced FAD molecules are formed. Totally we have four ATP molecules already produced by substrate level phosphorylation and 10 reduced NAD, it's easier to write NADH, okay, but prefer writing reduced NAD in exam, and totally two reduced FAD or FADH2, okay, for one glucose molecule in aerobic cellular respiration, totally four ATP molecules are produced at substrate level phosphorylation, and 10 reduced NAD and two molecules of reduced FAD are formed. But the story gets complicated here. Theoretically, three molecules of ATP can be produced from each molecule of reduced NAD and two molecules of ATP from each molecule of reduced FAD. So theoretically, 10 reduced NAD entering the ETC will result in 30 ATP molecules and two reduced FAD entering the ETC will result with four ATP. Totally 34 ATP molecules will be produced by oxidative phosphorylation. This yield cannot be achieved unless ADP and inorganic phosphate are available inside the mitochondria. 
and about 25% of the total energy yield of electron transfer is used to transport ADP into the mitochondrion and ATP into the cytoplasm. Ideally, one reduced NAD entering the ETC produces on average of 2.5 molecules of ATP. And each reduced FAD produces 1.5 molecules of ATP. And this changes the overall number. 10 times 2.5 means 25 ATP molecules from reduced NAD molecules. And 2 times 1.5 means 3 ATP. Totally 28 ATP molecules are produced by oxidative phosphorylation. So 4 ATP is from substrate level and 28 ATP molecules from oxidative phosphorylation. Totally 32 ATP molecules are produced per one single glucose molecule. So which numbers are you going to use? Well, there hadn't been any question in the past in A level asking numbers of ATP produced per glucose molecule. But the Cambridge Biology textbook follows this ideal number. So according to Cambridge, even though theoretically 3 ATPs per 1 reduced NAD is produced, ideally 2.5. And, and ideally 1.5 ATP molecules produced per each reduced FAD entering the ETC. That's what you need to follow up. Well, here is the same diagram that I used, and here is the table that I've taken from the Cambridge textbook. As you can see here, by oxidative phosphorylation, totally 28 ATP molecules are produced, which means that Cambridge textbook has used the number that is in reality, an ideal number. Well, since I've taken this diagram from a university textbook, there seems to be a, another problem, which is a very technical uh, problem here. You don't even need to bother yourself if you are an A-level student or a SAT biology student. But extra detailed information won't hurt. The diagram here shows the total number of ATPs produced per glucose molecule as either 30 or 32. So where does the difference come from? Remember, the two NAD molecules are produced in glycolysis and they're in the cytoplasm. As these NADs enter the mitochondrion, their energy efficiency decreases. It means that sometimes the hydrogens are picked up by FAD instead of NAD as they, uh, as they enter the mitochondrion. Well, theoretically, two reduced NADs produced by glycolysis as they enter the mitochondrion may lose their energy efficiency, resulting in two less ATP molecules produced. But just forget about what I said recently, okay? Per one glucose molecule, the total number of ATPs produced in aerobic respiration, according to A2 biology, is 32 molecules. That will be all for this video.